All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I hope everybody had a fantastic weekend. So uh, general administrative stuff before I get started. Uh, you will be getting your graded lab reports or your lab drafts with comments back by email. Um, so be on the lookout for those emails. Um, I've realized that people apparently like, like it when I grade them on my uh, iPad because then when they think my handwriting is scribbly, they can zoom in on it and try to <laughs> read what I said. So I can do that. Um, so like I said, you're getting them by email. Um, and remember that there is the final inquisitive assignment as well as the lit assignment that are due uh, the Monday after break. Today we are going to uh, continue talking about hypersensitivity, um, aka allergy. We're going to finish discussing some aspects of type 1 hypersensitivity and then we'll move into the other types. So let's see here. Um, so if you remember, we've got these four different types of mechanisms that we often think of as the four hypersensitivity reactions um, that are part of an uh, allergy response, though they do have some overlap with mechanisms that we see in autoimmunity um, as well as in transplantation. And your textbook's figure of the four different hypersensitivity reactions is shown at the bottom. We spent, we started last time, or we spent part of last time talking about the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, which is also known as immediate type hypersensitivity. Um, that part about being immediate type hypersensitivity is a key part of uh, identifying these responses because you tend to see these responses happening often within minutes um, after exposure to the allergen. Um, they are mediated by IgE and mast cells. And uh, we have IgE that is um, bound to the FC receptor on the mast cells, sort of that's pre-coded, pre-ready to go. If the antigen comes by, then it will bind to those antibodies that are on the FC receptor and lead to the mast cells degranulating. Um, and so you can, uh, we talked a little bit about what some of those products were that are coming from the mast cell last time. Um, we talked about the fact that the immediate type hypersensitivity is something that actually only happens the second time you see that antigen. Um, and um, as you can see here, some of the manifestations of a type 1 hypersensitivity response include uh, anaphylactic shock. Um, as well as hay fever, has asthma, hives, uh, food allergy, and eczema. And that was sort of where I left us off last time, was at this slide where we were thinking about some of the antigens that are uh, commonly thought of as type 1 hypersensitivity antigens, or they're commonly seen as type 1 hypersensitivity antigens. So this includes things like plant pollens, uh, ryegrass, ragweed, timothy grass, birch. This includes foods, so like a nut allergy, a seafood allergy, egg allergy. Um, this includes the uh, allergies to animal hair um, or to latex. This includes responses to bee venom, wasp venom, uh, dust mites, um, as well as to a number of different drugs. And so you can see all of these things shown on the right as well. And what you might realize when you look at this is that um, on their surface, uh, a ragweed, a response to ragweeds, um, which is you know a general um, allergy that you see in the spring, um, doesn't really remind you that much of a bee sting response. Those look kind of different, which looks kind of different than what might happen if you have a response to wearing latex gloves or a response to eating peanuts. You know, these don't all sound 
like exactly the same response, yet here I'm telling you they're all type 1 hypersensitivity responses. And the reason why these will end up looking different is that we're seeing the type 1 hypersensitivity response happen in different anatomic locations. So it's all about which part of the body is first exposed to that uh, allergen and where do we start making the response. And so I'll show you some of these specific examples on the next few slides. But what you can see is that sometimes we're talking about what happens when we see that antigen intravenously or directly in the blood. Sometimes we'll first see that antigen through the skin. Sometimes we'll see it maybe in the eye or the nose. Sometimes the first time we see it is, again, in, a little deeper in the airway. Sometimes the first time we see it is in the GI tract. Um, and so the reason why these sort of look a little bit different is because we're seeing that type 1 hypersensitivity response in each of these different anatomic locations. But in reality, it's all mast cell degranulation leading to these issues. Um, so one of the types of type 1 hypersensitivity responses that people uh, will see is a response uh, in the skin. Um, and sometimes this is known as the wheel and flare. Um, sometimes people also talk about acute urticaria. That's a fancy word for hives. Um, and here you can see the example of a type 1 hypersensitivity response in the skin or the wheel and flare. There are mast cells that live in the skin. So right now you have mast cells in the skin. If those mast cells see antigen, they're going to degranulate. And whenever mast cells um, degranulate, we see a lot of the same types of things happen with regard to vessels and with regard to smooth muscle. Skin doesn't have a ton of muscle, but it does have some vessels. Um, and so what we'll see is when those mast cells are activated, we get changes to the blood vessels, particularly with regard to things like vascular permeability. Um, and so we're going to get a lot of cells, fluids, and proteins on, in the skin, in that location of the skin. And when we tend to see a lot of fluids, proteins, inflammation in a particular area of the skin, we're going to get a little bit of swelling. We're going to get a little bump, a little red area. And so this is what you might see if you first saw that antigen in the skin. Um, here you can see some examples of allergy testing. Um, so if you were to go um, to the doctor to get allergy tests, often what they do is they will deposit a whole bunch of antigen under your skin. So they'll just inject lots of different antigens. Um, in some cases, if people have very severe cases, they'll have to use your back. Um, and they'll just deposit different antigens, and they'll look to see if you get little bubbles of swelling that tell you, oh yeah, you have some mast cells that are sensitized to that particular uh, allergen. I mean, could, you could do this in other anatomic locations, but some of those um, might be more problematic than having a little bubble on your skin. Um, this is a little safer. Um, and so you can see um, you know, a negative as well as some positives um, that would tell you, oh, this is what you're allergic to. Um, and so this is just that, that type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, those mast cells reacting in the skin. Um, if those same mast cells are going to respond in the respiratory tract, um, things are going to uh, look a little bit different. We are going to see some changes to the blood vessel. So here you can see we've got changes in the blood vessel um, permeability um, and changes in the epithelium, but we also have a fair amount of smooth muscle that's going to be a, that's going to contract here. And so we're going to see that smooth muscle contraction 
which is going to give us constriction of the throat and airways, which could lead to difficulty in swallowing or breathing, as well as wheezing. Um, we're also going to get some increased mucus secretion. Um, and we're going to see a lot of expulsion of contents, whether that's through coughing, sneezing, uh, expulsion of phlegm. And so in most cases, if it's an anatomic location where we can expel the contents, we're going to expel the contents. In the respiratory tract, you can expel the contents to try to get rid of whatever it is. Um, again, we're going to see that uh, contraction of the small muscle as well as some of that inflammation. And because the respiratory tract also has um, the ability to secrete mucus, we're usually going to see a fair amount of mucus secretion as well. And so this is what we're seeing when I find a grain of pollen anywhere in, I don't know, the county um, <laughs> with my lovely respiratory allergies. This is also um, what people will see when they have a dust mite allergy or a uh, response to dust. A lot of people think about um, be, you know, having dust allergies as like being allergic to the little particles of dust in the air. You're actually not allergic to little particles of dust in the air. You're actually allergic to mites, which are very small microscopic arthropods. You can see a dust mite there that feeds on the dust. Um, they actually make certain proteases, and you're actually making an uh, allergic response to a dust mite protease, um, which I did not learn until perhaps I was much older than I should have, that there was such a thing called dust mites. There are all sorts of kinds of mites that are microscopic things that you can't see. Um, if you really want to be freaked out, if it was Halloween, I would say you could definitely look this up. Um, you can le learn about the mites that live on your face. Um, <laughs> because there are a bunch and it's just lovely. Anyway, um, these are the dust mites. Um, they make uh, some proteases, uh, der, uh, uh, the derps, um, and they are, uh, you are exposed to them through the respiratory tract. Um, we can also see uh, similar types of um, responses um, with food allergies where we have um, the food antigen that is stimulating muscle, mast cells, but now those mast cells of course are in the GI tract. And so we're going to see again contraction of the smooth muscle and expulsion of the contents um, in the GI tract. We're also going to see um, you know, changes in the blood vessels, increased permeability, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so we're going to see um, things like diarrhea or vomiting, um, stomach cramps as we're getting that smooth muscle contraction, um, and as we're getting some of the um, the uh, inflammation. We also sometimes will see some of the other symptoms, like you might see hives after um, food allergy, and that's because oftentimes that antigen will also get absorbed um, at, if it's in the GI tract, the way that other kind of foods are going to get absorbed. Um, and so again, it's really all that same process um, of mast cells degranulating. It's just a question of what's going on with the anatomy in the location where the mast cell has degranulated. Um, and so this shows some different things that can happen with um, food allergies um, because we can see a few different things going on. Sometimes if you're allergic to a food, you end up seeing a lot of skin effects. Um, some of that is because you actually have to touch your food <laughs> before you eat it. And you're going to encounter that food in the skin and in the GI tract. Um, other, sometimes you're gonna really see your symptoms in the mouth when you're first exposed. Sometimes you're gonna see those uh, effects in the GI tract. Sometimes you might even see some of them in the respiratory tract because you may aerosolize the food some as you're eating it. Um, and so food allergy can actually end up looking like a lot of uh, different reactions. Um, so uh, just sort of be aware of that. Um, 
and you can see this example that I um, have I sort of mentioned to you when we were talking about mucosal immunity. Oftentimes in the intestine, we expect that we should be getting mucosal tolerance. We should be expect that we should be getting a regulatory T cell response. Um, but if we have maybe seen that allergen the first time in the skin or somewhere else and made a response that is not a uh, Treg response, perhaps we've made a Th2 response. Now, when we see that allergen again in the intestine, we're going to make this pathologic Th2 response instead of the Treg response we should have made. Um, and so where we first see that allergen may be of particular importance um, in what kind of response we are making. Uh, we also um, have anaphylactic shock. Um, anaphylactic shock is uh, the particularly severe um, case where we are seeing type 1 hypersensitivity responses happening um, in many locations at once, and this is because of an antigen in the bloodstream. If that antigen is in the bloodstream, then we're going to have um, mast cells degranulating sort of in many places in uh, the blood and connective tissue. And so we're going to be seeing um, blood vessels throughout the body that are going to change permeability. Um, that is going to give us a lot of swelling. That's also going to give us a number of cardiac issues as we change things like blood volume in the vessels versus blood volume outside of the vessels. Um, and it's going to lead to mast cells in all of the locations we have previously seen potentially degranulating. So again, we're going to see issues with the heart and vascular system. We're going to see lots of swelling, but we're also going to see problems with blood pressure, oxygen to the tissues, all that unfortunate stuff, as well as some of those issues we were just talking about with the respiratory tract, with the GI tract. And so, um, if an individual ha undergoes anaphylactic shock, um, they are going to be having a lot of these very, very severe um, issues. And this is all, again, that same process now just happening in the bloodstream and as opposed to localized in a particular tissue. Um, so if we uh, look at this response in general, um, you might say, okay, so I, I understand what this response is, sure. But why the heck did we evolve a response like this? Why in the world did we evolve some of these types of responses? They do not seem to be benefiting us in any way. I, as a person who has many of them, do not feel benefited <laughs> by many of these types of responses. And what we have realized is that many of the major allergens that we see have quite a bit of cross-reactivity to antigens that we find on eukaryotic parasites, um, particularly, in, as is shown here, helminths, though it could be some other eukaryotic parasites. So you can see that a cat allergen um, has a cross-reactivity to this helmet antigen. You can see that some pollen allergens or a cockroach allergen have some similarities to some other um, helminth antigens. You can see that the dust mite protease has some similarities to another helminth antigen. Um, and so what may be going on here is that um, we evolve these responses to deal with these eukaryotic multicellular parasites like helminths, where the best thing to do is to secrete toxic products at them to try to kill them. That makes sense evolutionarily. And it just so happens that we are getting this inappropriate response as a cross-reactive response. There are some other hypotheses out there. Um, in reality, I think that all of these hypotheses have some truth to them. 
um, because there is one other type of molecule that it does seem that many of these allergens um, have some similarities to. So there may be one other aspect of cross-reactivity here going on. And in order to understand this, um, we, we can think a little bit about both some of these um, pathogens as well as some other pieces of the response we've seen. One piece that people have always thought was weird when looking at these responses is if you have, say, a tapeworm, the way you deal with a tapeworm is, yeah, you put some mast cell molecules like histamine or whatever to try to kill it. Yes, that makes sense. But one thing that doesn't always make sense is the idea of expelling it. So if you remember, I told you about how with the respiratory type one hypersensitivity reaction, it's all about expelling. You gotta get the stuff out. You try to get everything out of the respiratory tract. With the GI, you try to get everything out of the GI tract. Some of like, and, it, and they're happening within minutes. This is the immediate type response. Tapeworms are kind of a long-term problem. You don't necessarily need to respond to a tapeworm in seven minutes and try to expel it within seven minutes. I just made up seven minutes. I don't know where seven minutes came from, right? Like that's sort of weird in terms of a, a response. And what we have realized is that there is actually, there are actually some things that you need to expel within minutes. Those things particularly include things like venoms. Um, as well as some other environmental toxins. And so there's also some idea that this actually may be an anti-venom response, um, where we're trying to expel that venom as quickly as possible. And there also does seem to be some cross-reactivities to certain venoms. Quick aside, fun fact, well, biology fact, what's the difference between venom and poison? We think about a venomous snake versus a poisonous snake. Those two words actually mean different things, and it's important for bio as a biologist that you know the difference between venom and poison. Yeah. Correct. So if it has a thing that it like you know gives you in its bite, that stuff is called venom. If you eat it and you die. It's poison. So most snakes are not actually poisonous snakes. I don't know who's eaten the snakes. Um, they're actually venomous snakes. Um, so in fact, venoms <laughs> um, are uh, a particular issue here. All right, so this is sort of type one hypersensitivity. Then we can move on to thinking about our other types of hypersensitivity, particularly um, next type two. Um, so with type two hypersensitivity, one of the most important things to remember is that we are looking at a hypersensitivity reaction that does involve antibodies. Um, and those antibodies are usually IgG or IgM. When we get to the type three hypersensitivity reaction, you will see that there are also antibodies, IgG or IgM. And so the thing you might want to pay attention to here is what the heck is the difference between type two and type three? Because it's not just antibodies, IgG or IgM. That works for both of them. The thing that is key with the type two hypersensitivity response is that the antigen is on the surface of a cell. And so you can see that antibody is directed against a cell surface antigen. And here you can see our little antigen, and it's on a cell in this view from your uh, textbook. And so the, what's going to happen with this IgG or IgM, it's going to be binding to some antigen on a cell, and we're going to see something bad happen to this cell. So we're going to 
kill the cell. It could be by complement activation. It could be by ADCC, whatever. Something bad is going to happen to this cell that has antigen on its surface because of the binding of the antibody. There, I'm going to tell you about two different examples of type 2 hypersensitivity response kind of disease diseases. Both of them involve red blood cells. Um, and so red blood cells are, in fact, a very common target. So I have to tell you a quick thing about red blood cells. Um, so as you are aware, we have blood types, um, A, B, A, B, O blood types. Those are based on some antigens that are on the surface of our red blood cells. All of our red blood cells have some lipids or protein that then has this carbohydrate at the end. And so you can see we've got N-acetylglucosamine, we've got galactose, oh no, sorry, N-acetylgalactosamine, galactose, N-acetylglucosamine, galactose, fucose, right? Great, very exciting carbohydrates. Some of us have an enzyme that lets us add another carbohydrate. Some people have an enzyme where they add a sh this sugar, this N-acetylgalactosamine, this fifth sugar. Some people have an enzyme that adds a galactose. Some people don't have either enzyme. And so their sugars just look like this. They only have four across instead of five across. Those are the differences in the blood types. So this blood type that only has the four, is missing the terminal sugar, is type O. This one is type B. This one is type A. And so these are different cell surface antigens. You have one particular, well, actually, you have two chromosomes with these enzymes, one from your mom, one from your dad. So you could either get you know, A and A and be type A. You can get A and O and still be type A because you're still making type A <laughs> antigens, et cetera. Um, and so here are all of the options here. This talks about these are sort of what you can have in terms of your genes. This tells you what carbohydrate you actually end up having on the surface of your cells. And this tells you what antigens you have. OK, cool. Remember that when B cells are developing, you make one of every B cell. So everybody during B cell development makes a B cell that can react with the A. And everybody makes a B cell that can react with the B. If you have type A blood, well, that A B cell gets killed through tolerance mechanisms, probably central tolerance mechanisms. You have, um, but the B sticks around. You still have your anti-B B cells, because that wasn't a self-antigen. If you have B, you kill the, the B cell that's making the B antibody, but you keep the A. If you have AB, you kill both of them, because they're both self-antigens. If you're type O, you don't kill either of them. And so you can have these different serum antibodies. So everybody has serum antibodies. Um, to other blood groups, and guess, unless they're AB, in which they have none. Um, there's also another antigen, RH, um, where we can have the same kind of things happen. One other piece of this um, that sometimes people ask questions about, and th it's a good question because it does mean you've been paying close attention this semester, is that sometimes you say, OK, I understand how it is that if I have type A blood, I made a B cell that responds to B. I made a B cell that responds to A and a B cell that responds to B. I killed the A one in central tolerance. I kept the B one. I understand all that. But then the thing I don't understand is 
why do I actually have antibodies against B antigen in my blood that are going to make like blood transfusions a problem? How did that B cell get activated? How did that anti B B cell get activated? How did it class switch to be a plasma cell? Or differentiate to be a plasma cell? How might it class switch to make IgGs? Like, yeah, I get why I have the B cell, but why do I have the problem antibodies? It turns out that these carbohydrates are very common carbohydrates on a lot of the microbes in your GI tract. Um, and so all of these B cells are getting tons of stimulation. You're going to not just have an anti-B B cell in this person, you're going to make a ton of anti-B antibodies because so many microbes have similar carbohydrates. Um, so, okay, fine. This is sort of the general idea of how blood group and blood group antigens work. One of the ways that this can be problematic is in a disease called erythroblastosis fetalis, also known as hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, and since the zoom controls are covering up where it says erythroblastosis fetalis, you can also see it right here. So, um, erythroblastosis fetalis often is related to the Rh antigen, either Rh plus or Rh minus. If you have, if you are, happen to be a person who is Rh plus, you don't make antibodies against it because it's a self antigen. If you're Rh minus, then you make some antibodies against the Rh antigen. Yeah. And so what can happen is a situation where we might have um, a mom who is pregnant. And when that mom is pregnant, um, she is an RH minus mom. So we've got RH minus mom who is pregnant. When RH minus mom is pregnant, sometimes she might have an RH plus baby. So here you can see baby's red blood cells. They have those RH antigens on it. Mom does not. Mom doesn't really have any RH antibodies normally. She maybe she has the B cell. She hasn't primed up a lot of the antibodies. But at delivery, she's going to get exposed to some of baby's red blood cells. And when she gets exposed to baby's red blood cells, suddenly her B cell that responds to RH antigen, which she has because it didn't get killed because it's not a self antigen, that B cell is going to be activated. We're going to make plasma cells. She is now going to make tons of anti RH antibodies, IgM and IgG. And whatever. No one cares. Like, she's going to have all sorts of antibodies in her body, and they're not against the self antigen, so she's going to live happily ever after. And that's fine. However, she might get pregnant again and have a second baby. And what if, and if that second baby is also an RH positive baby, now we're going to have problems. Because we've made some anti-RH IgG. And what was the one of our really important things that we learned about IgG with regard to pregnancy? Yeah, Michael. IgG can cross the placenta. And so now this IgG that mom was making it's fine, it wasn't doing anything to her, she was living happily ever after, can cross the placenta into the baby. And now this is going to destroy the baby's red blood cells. And so we're going to end up having destruction of fetal red blood cells. And so we are going to have a baby that is born basically without red blood cells. Um, that baby is going to be very anemic. 
Um, there also are going to be, um, you can see that that baby ends up um, having to have uh, some specific uh, light therapies because of some of the breakdown products from the red blood cells that are um, getting uh, killed. And so this is really severe. This is really serious for that baby. And this is a type two hypersensitivity response. Happily, we have ways to deal with this. And we can use our immunology knowledge to deal with this. One thing that happens during general prenatal care is that moms are tested to see if they're Rh plus or Rh minus. If they're Rh plus, then this isn't going to happen and no one cares. But if they're Rh minus, they're going to actually kind of see what's up with the baby. And if, say, Rh minus mom is having Rh plus baby, we're going to say, oh boy, this is, this is potentially problematic. We're, we're going to worry about that. And so mom is treated with a, uh, something known as Rogam. And so you can see Rogam here. Um, and she particular might, might be treated with Rogam either um, sort of early in this second pregnancy. She, it could also happen sort of during the first pregnancy to stop this uh, B cell production. But mom's going to be treated with Rogam. And Rogam, as you can see here, is an antibody. Shown here is a little blue antibody. That antibody is an IgG that binds to the Rh antigen. You can see it here as well. So you can, you've got Rogam. It's an antibody. It's binding to that Rh antigen. If you recall, When we have a uh, B cells making a response, when we have naive B cells making a response, if there are pre-existing antibodies, IgG antibodies, that binds to the antigen, those will also bind to an FC gamma receptor on the B cell and turn off that naive B cell. And so naive B cells can't get activated in the presence of this pre-existing IgG. And so we give mom this antibody, Rogam, to keep her naive B cells from being activated so that she can't make antibodies that are going to cause this problem. And so if we treat mom with Rogam, that's going to stop naive B cell activation. So you can see prevents B cell activation and memory cell formation. And so we're not going to have um, these issues in subsequent pregnancies. So yay team immunology for having solutions. Um, the other example that I'm going to tell you about for a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction um, is a, a type of penicillin allergy. It turns out that there are penicillin allergies of all four types. So um, if, for example, you have a penicillin allergy, it may not be this type 2 one that I'm going to tell you about. There are type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4 penicillin allergies. Um, but the example that I'm going to tell you about is a type 2 hypersensitivity penicillin allergy. And we can see some of the important details of what's going on with penicillin here. We should start by looking at the uh, image in the middle. The image in the middle is penicillin. Um, and with penicillin, one thing that's really important is that there's a bond that's very reactive. So you can see this is the reactive bond, helpfully labeled as reactive bond. And what's supposed to happen with penicillin is that that reactive bond will react with a bacterial enzyme. 
So here you can see the reactive bond. It reacts with a bacterial transpeptidase, a bacterial enzyme, and inactivates it and stops bacteria from doing their thing. So that's kind of what should happen. But in some people, in some situations, that reactive bond in penicillin can react with one of those sugars on a red blood cell. And so instead of binding to the bacterial transpeptidase, this big penicillin molecule can bind to a red blood cell. And we'll get penicillin binding to the red blood cell, as you can see here on the right. Now, our red blood cell has this great big thing on it. <laughs> and that's a new antigen that we didn't have before. And we can have antibodies that might bind to that antigen. So here you can see the penicillin on the surface of the red blood cell, and you can see antibodies binding to that. So note we've got a cell surface antigen, and we've got an IgG or IgM antibody. And those red blood cells can either be destroyed by complement, they can be, or be phagocytosed by macrophages. In either case, the patient is going to have no red blood cells or very few red blood cells. We're going to have a big loss of red blood cells, and that patient's going to have anemia. Um, this is known as hemolytic anemia um, because we are lysing the red blood cells thanks to um, this penicillin reaction. Um, and so this is sort of the other famous example of a type 2 hypersensitivity response. Um, fortunately, um, again, this is something that we can, you know, treat or predict relatively well. In a lot of cases, we don't tend to see a ton of type 2 hypersensitivities um, clinically, at least to my knowledge. Um, we can also think about uh, the type 3 hypersensitivity disease. Um, and so type 3 hypersensitivity is similar to type 2 hypersensitivity in that we have an antibody, an IgG or an IgM antibody. The difference is that the antigen is a secreted protein. It's a soluble antigen. It doesn't, I guess, have to be protein. It's secreted something. It's a soluble antigen. And as a result, we don't have the antibody binding to cells. We have the antibody binding to this free antigen and making some type of immune complex. So we're getting these big complexes of antigens and antibodies together. Um, and those immune complexes are going to be what causes the issue. Um, sometimes people talk about type 3 hypersensitivity as um, immune complex disease. Uh, you can see immune complexes and immune complex disease here. Um, and they are related to concentrations of both antigen and antibody. If you were in a situation where you had a lot of antigen and a small amount of antibody, each antibody could have its own antigen, look like this, you'd never get any big clumps. If you were in a situation where you had a lot of antibody and very little antigen, you wouldn't really have enough antigen to pull together many antibodies, you wouldn't get any big clumps. But if you have sort of a just right concentration of antigen and a just right concentration of antibody, you can get this sort of um, complex where you have multiple antibodies, each binding to the same antigen, which then binds to another antibody, and you get sort of these big clusters, which are known as immune complexes. And so you can kind of see that we only see those antigen antibody complexes sort of in, at this middle level of um, just the right amount of antigen, just the right amount of antibody. When we have those immune complexes, they can cause disease in a lot of different ways. One thing that can happen is that they can 
start the complement cascade and sort of lead to inflammation. And so they're going to lead to inflammation in random parts around the body. Um, you can also imagine that they could, um, and so you can see sort of aspects of that inflammation happening in whatever tissue where those immune complexes are. You can particularly imagine that some areas of the body might be particularly susceptible to having those immune complexes getting trapped. And so like, it's one thing if you have one little clump. It's another thing if you get like a ton of clumps that all get stuck in your skin. Then you're gonna get a ton of inflammation in your skin that's gonna cause problems. Imagine similarly if you have, start to have a bunch of those in the alveoli where you're trying to get filtrate, you know, things going through delicately to move air. You're gonna get a whole bunch of inflammation right there. Think about um, in the glomeruli where you're filtering in the kidney. You suddenly get a huge bunch of clumps there. That's gonna be a problem. Think about your joint. Um, and so we can actually see sometimes that those immune complexes can occlude vessels. Themse they can themselves just be in the way. Or, and you can imagine that again, in alveoli, in glomeruli, in a lot of sort of small delicate tissues, as well as inducing inflammation and inducing some tissue injury in that location. Um, and so um, whether this is, you know, whatever happens um, in terms of clearing that immune complex, um, bad stuff can happen. As with the other types of hypersensitivity reactions, there is a famous type of type three hypersensitivity disease. And to talk about this famous type three hypersensitivity disease, I have to tell you a little bit about this other phenomenon called passive antibody therapy. We actually did talk a little bit about passive antibody therapy before, um, earlier in the semester. And in fact, it will come up a little bit more at one other point, but we need to think about passive anti ther antibody therapy here. So passive antibody therapy is a therapy where we take antibodies from say an immune individual, somebody who already made antibodies, and we inject them into our patient. And that will help our patient recover. And you're generally going to do this because this particular patient has some severe problem where you can't wait around for them, their own B cells to make a response. You need antibodies now. And so you get antibodies that were pre-made from somebody who made them before, you put them into this patient, the patient recovers, hooray! Downside. They never actually turned on their own B cells, so they're not really going to have a good long-term response. Um, if they were to be infected with the same thing again, you'd need to give them passive antibodies again because they never made their own B cells. Um, and you know, this is something that has been used for a very long time, 100 years or so. Um, this is... Um, this was used at the beginning of COVID with convalescent serum. Then we started to make um, antibodies in the lab. So this is a, a pretty you know, standard thing. And some of the times where you might get treated with passive antibody therapy are shown on the right. Um, so the ones that I will mention include the black widow spider bite, um, botulism, um, rabies, um, or a snake bite. What you can notice about all four of those things, the reason why I picked those th uh, four in particular, is because they are things that you need to respond fast. If you get a black widow spider bite, and there is venom, see venom versus poison, important knowledge. If you get some of that venom in you, you need to deal with that venom now. You don't have two weeks to wait for your B cells to make a response. You need to respond right away. And so, in, so what we end up doing is we give you antibodies against that venom. Um, same thing, like I said, with the snake bite, same thing with botulism, same thing with um, rabies. Those are all um, things where we see some pretty rapid pathology. And you could imagine, 
that one thing you might do when you are, we're, we're just going to focus on our black widow spider bite. Imagine that, okay, so to deal with a black widow spider bite, we're going to give you antibodies from somebody who had a black widow spider bite. That means you had to like have someone who got a black widow spider bite and made antibodies, um, which probably is not going to be very many people because it's kind of deadly. And you're probably not going to get like a ton of antibodies from that person to have in the antibody store. And so what happens is this was actually, we actually will do this in horses. And so we will actually get antibodies from horses. So you can see it's horse antivenin. So we basically just inject the antigen into horses and then get the antibodies out and then just have these antibodies ready to go. One of the reasons you could do this, of course, is because horses are big. So you can get a lot of antibodies from a horse. And you can see um, the use of horse materials here a lot. All right, so let's imagine you get a black widow spider bite. And you are going to get some antibodies from a horse, horse antivenin, to save you. And you're going to be very happy. One little problem with this scheme. Are you a horse? <laughs> Michael, what do you think? You're shaking your head well. You're not a horse. So why is that important to us? Why should we, po why do we have to point that out here? Yeah, Jay. Because it's a matching of the MSC. Nope, so I'm just injecting you with proteins from a horse. I'm injecting you with a whole lot of proteins from a horse, yeah. They're foreign. I'm, bas in, I'm giving you a whole bunch of horse antibodies. You're going to recover. Yay. But I also just had to give you a ton of foreign protein. Right? And you are actually going to make an immune response against horse antibodies, against this foreign protein. So in... Well, yes, I gave you this great treatment. You are going to make an immune response against horse antibodies. You are going to make anti-antibody antibodies or anti-horse anti anti -horse antibody antibodies. Okay, fine. Here's a horse antibody, it's pink. And you're gonna make some antibody against that horse antibody. Okay, whatever, fine. Is this gonna be a problem in your life? If your body now has a lot of anti-horse antibodies? What do you think, Christina? I saw your face. Yeah, like you are, no, you should be totally fine. Whatever, you got a bunch of anti-horse antibodies. Except, as Christina points out, if you happen to encounter horse antibodies again. Most likely, you're probably not. But what happens if you get a black widow spider bite again? Number one, I'm going to ask you about the choices you're making in your life. <laughs> Number two, <laughs> what happens if you get a black wi widow spider bite again? Yeah, Ermi. So you're, so you're not going to make a response. You're going to be in bad shape. And so what are, we gonna what are you going to want to have happen? So you don't die. Y you, you want the horse stuff again. But now you've got an immune response to it. So you can't necessarily be treated with that the second time. So don't get your two black widow spider bites. This is what we learn. <laughs> no promises? OK. I'm teaching you important things before you go home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Stay away from venom, poison, and black widow spider bites. Um, and even in individuals who are getting that horse anti-venom uh, the first time, they are going to be making a response. And the kinetics of that response, the timing of that response is going to vary a little bit. 
And so in some situations, here you, here you are making your antibodies. The red line is the, the white antibodies, the antibodies you're making against the horse. Antibodies. The yellow line is the antibodies we just gave you from the horse. At some point, you might get, in, and again, you're going to, we're going to inject them in, so they're going to go really high, and then they're going to get degraded over time because they're a protein. At some point, you might get to this place where you're at that just right antibody antigen level. Yes, the antigen in this case is a horse antibody. Sometime you might get to this just right level to start to make immune complexes. And you might start to make immune complexes and have immune complex disease, which could include things like fever, vasculitis or inflammation of blood vessels, um, arthritis, um, inflammation in the joints, or nephritis, inflammation in the kidneys. Um, you're going to see a couple examples of serum sickness um, on the next page. Um, serum sickness is the name for the type 3 hypersensitivity reaction that we see after passive antibody therapy. So serum sickness, because we used to treat you with serum from a person. Um, serum sickness is the name of this process. You will, there are pictures of it on the next slide, and some people will not like the pictures. They're not the worst pictures I've ever seen, but I'm trying to be helpful. Um, and so um, if we're seeing that antigen in the uh, bloodstream, we might start to see vasculitis, where we're getting those antigen complexes and blood vessel walls, nephritis, where we're getting them in the glomeruli, arthritis, where we're getting them in the joint spaces. Um, if we are putting in that antigen in the skin, we're going to get some um, rash, as you can see here. Um, sometimes we'll also see this at the alveolar capillar capillary interface um, if the uh, antigen is inhaled. Um, and so you can see serum sickness is uh, not good. And this is the most famous example of a type 3 hypersensitivity response. Um, one of the other reasons why this is actually really important to mention is that after break, we are at one day going to be talking about immunotherapy. Um, and when we talk about immunotherapy, a big part of our discussion that day is, will actually be the fact that we treat a lot of diseases with antibodies. We actually um, inject antibodies to treat a lot of diseases. Um, and how we design and how we make those antibodies to make sure they are not foreign. Um, how we make what are known as humanized antibodies um, is really important largely because we're trying to avoid these types of reactions. Um, our final type of uh, hypersensitivity response is the type 4 hypersensitivity response. Um, so a couple of things to realize about a type 4 hypersensitivity response. Uh, first is that it, just like type 1 has another name, well, they've all kind of all had another name in some ways. But remember, type 1, I said, was also known as immediate type hypersensitivity. And the timing was really important. Type 4 also has a name with, that has to do with timing, and the timing is important. And so type 4 is sometimes known as a delayed type hypersensitivity response, um, often referred to as a DTH. So immunologists sometimes just talk about DTHs. Um, and that's a type 4 hypersensitivity or delayed type hypersensitivity response. And so that should, again, tell you timing is going to be a key thing to be noticing here. This figure from your textbook very helpfully says some days later. Um, when I think of a type uh, a DTH or a type 4 hypersensitivity response, I usually think of 72 to 96 hours. Um, so kind of three, four days, unlike sort of 15 minutes, <laughs> like the immediate type might be. Um, one of the big things that is also important about a type 4 hypersensitivity response is that it is one that's going to involve T cells. 
So unlike your other types of hypersensitivity responses, which all involve antibodies, a DTH involves, a, involves T cells. Um, you can see some of the um, things that induce DTH responses on this slide. Um, the big ones in, that sort of I sometimes think about will be things like um, hair dye or nickel allergy. If you um, have sometimes wear cheap jewelry and get a really bad rash from wearing cheap jewelry, that's usually a nickel allergy, um, as well as things like a poison IV response. Um, so just like with a type 1 hypersensitivity response, we can think about two different phases with our DTH. Um, and those phases uh, are actually quite similar to what we see with the immediate as well. There is a phase where you activate the T cells, where you get the T cells to go from naive to effector T cells. And you have a phase where the effector T cells do their thing. The first phase where you are activating um, those T cells is known as the sensitization phase. So this is going to happen the first time you encounter the antigen. The, when you first encounter the antigen, it is going to be presented by antigen presenting cells, it is going to turn on your helper T cell response, and it is in fact going to uh, push those helper T cells to a Th1 response. Sometimes when I think of a, a DTH, a delayed type hypersensitivity response, or a type 4, um, I think of it's just a real fancy name for making a Th1 response. <laughs> Um, and so you're going to make these Th1 cells um, with this response. And this is the first time you've seen that antigen. You're going to be fine. Nothing bad's going to happen, whatever. However, if you see that antigen again, you already have effector Th1 cells. And so now the second time you see that antigen, those Th1 cells are going to start activating macrophages, and they are going to start inducing a major inflammatory response. Um, and so they are going to start doing things like making cytokines to act on the vasculature, making cytokines that are going to lead to a whole bunch of inflammation. But again, this is going to take a couple days because those T cells need to move. They're probably not at that original site. They may need a little bit of time for activation and movement. And so instead of seeing the 15 minutes thing, like with the mast cells, because the mast cells were already in the tissue and ready to go, they didn't have to do transcription, they didn't have to do translation, they didn't have to do anything. The T cells take a little bit of time. And so we get that kind of 72, 96 hours. Um, one major example of, a, of one of these responses is the poison IV response. So if you um, get in contact with poison IV, there is this um, compound, um, erushiol, that is in the leaves. It can actually get into your body and it can react with a self protein. Now making a new antigen. Um, that antigen can now sensitize Th1 cells. And when you later come in contact with that same uh, compound again, now those Th1 cells that were previously activated can go and start responding in your skin and giving you this sort of characteristic rash. The other really famous um, Type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. This is going to be my last slide for today, so, but I do really want to sort of get through this because it makes the topic all goes together. Um, is known as the PPD. Um, so if you have been, so this is actually something that we do as a test to see if you have tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis tuberculosis that lives, can live silently in your lungs for a long period of time. 
And so we can't necessarily tell if you have tuberculosis very easily by looking at you because it might be silently in your lungs. One way we can tell is if we do a chest x-ray, but that's not something that we necessarily want to do for people a lot. Um, it, it's expensive, it's also a bunch of radiation. Um, if you are, say, a healthcare worker, if you work in a hospital, we, we want to know if you have tuberculosis like most of the time. We're going to give you, we want to test you for tuberculosis like at least every, say, six months. So you don't give tuberculosis to your patients. It would be bad for you to get a chest x-ray every six months. Fortunately, we also, we instead have this ability to do this thing called the PPD. Um, so if you have tuberculosis in your lungs, you will make a bunch of T cells. You will have a bunch of Th1 cells already responding to that bacteria in your lungs. And so what we do with a PPD test is we put a little bit of antigen under your skin. Here you can see that antigen um, that is actually going intradermal into the skin. And then we look to see, do you get a delayed type hypersensitivity response? Did you already have T cells that were activated? So when we put the antigen there, they could just traffic to the site and give you an immune response. If so, they're probably going to come in like 48 to 72 hours, and they're going to give you a little spot that's going to be raised and red. If you don't have this bacteria, you don't have T cells that are activated, and you're going to not get that response on your skin. Your skin is basically going to stay um, not red, not raised, no mark. Um, and so that's actually how we can test um, this is, again, a DTH response. Um, so the one reason I can always remember the amount of time on a DTH response is I remember how long you have to go back to the doctor <laughs> when you get a TB test. Um, and you're specifically looking for uh, this response, and so we use it clinically. Um, just so you know, outside of the US, um, the tuberculosis vaccine is given um, somewhat regularly. Um, and so this assumes you have not had that vaccine. If you've had that vaccine, then you're always positive. Um, and then, sad for you, you have to get chest x-rays. Um, but in the US, we don't give the tuberculosis vaccine. Um, and so we can use the PPD. Um, so if you are one of those people who like always is PPD positive, it might be because you got tuberculosis vaccinated as a child. Um, I hope that you guys have a great break. Um, and remember the homeworks that are due on Monday. And please let me know if you have any questions. Look out for emails with your um, lab reports.